<laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's always a hard act to follow. Um, so I don't want to disappoint. I'm not going to talk a lot about our therapy development. I was going to do a slightly different tack today, um, but I'm happy to talk about it in another context. I did want to talk about a really important component of what we do and of precision medicine that was presaged by a lot of talkers today, and that is the importance of disease mechanism in therapy. And it's a little bit of a lesson um, from SCN1A, and it's a lesson, and it's a nice example, Ingrid's, oh, Ingrid's here still, of how things that Ingrid and her colleagues have done have triggered um, experiments and, and ideas uh, for us, and I hope to let you know. I also, today is actually May the 4th be with you day, <laughs> and, and um, it was fitting that, that Dan mentioned um, spirituality and Buddhism. I'm, a, I'm actually an amateur Buddhist, and I need Hollywood blockbusters to, to get me interested and, and, and motivated, but I was surprised to learn that, that, that Star Wars actually had a lot of roots in, in Buddhist um, sort of um, pillars. And George Lucas was famous in quoting that wherever he lived in Hollywood, where there was 50% of his neighbours were Buddhists, and he didn't know the other 50%. Um, so when you, when you look at it, it is interesting. But I'm failing as a Buddhist because there's this concept of, um, of uh, Trishna, which is, which is a desire of thirst. And you need to expel this in, in order to reach um, certain states of, of, of awareness and of, ha of happiness, because it brings sorrow to have these. But I haven't been able to quench my thirst for trying to do something in epilepsy, and I hope, I hope that you'll forgive me, Dan. <laughs> and I, you know, we have a, actually one of our one of our students is also um, a Buddhist. Is he Timmy? Is he here today? There he is. And um, so I'm, I'm really, I think, I think it is important, and 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 and. and I've, leaning more and more in that as I take on the mantle of directorship, it becomes very important sometimes um, in, in considering um, the challenges that face you. So we've, everyone I think today, Ingrid, um, Anne uh, and Dan, they all have their sort of internal model for, for, for you know, how they look at diseases. And this is sort of what drives the way um, I look at diseases. I'm not a clinician, I'm a basic researcher. Um, but obviously I've been working, I mean I was motivated and I was inspired to do research. It was about 20 years ago that Sam came into my little tiny lab here at, at physiology and it was me. I, I had a, my lab was about as big as this desk at the time. It was me and I think it was on my own even. Um, and Tam, Sam took a leap of faith in me um, to join him on, on a sojourn for analysing our first epilepsy gene. And, and that, that sort of was for me, was, I was always interested in disease and this just gave me a fantastic framework. And then, of course, um, you know, introduced to Ingrid and the whole team, and it was a great, it was a great journey. So, you know, it starts with an urgent clinical need. If you look at secure genetic knowledge, family groups, natural history, disease models, and therapeutic modalities, commercial and regulatory environments, we could get, sort of get this. That all these things come together. There is a, a, a pathway to try and achieve some improved patient outcomes, and that, that's what drives us. Um, and I recognise, um, you know, that you need to have engagement with all of these factors in order to deliver an outcome. And that's praxis that, that, that Nelson um, just so nicely spoke about, uh, was one of the outlets for the things we want to do. Uh, up top right, that's me, Kelly and, um, and Alex. Um, they founded a company uh, with me called RogCon after their two kids, Roger and Connor, who have got SC and 2A mutations. And we quickly, we, we, we met about four years ago. I was serendipitously working on sodium channels um, and antisense oligos at the time. We came together and we saw that if we want to deliver these to the, to the families, that we just, you know, me doing it in the lab on a mouse is great, but it's not really going to move into the direction we need, which is getting it to the families. And it's a lot more complex um, doing that than just having a nice paper in the lab and, and trying to tie all these things together is really, really important. And so what I want to talk about today is, is, is the stuff about disease modelling and therapeutics. Do we have the resource, do we have the understanding we need that we can use that to, to help deliver a therapy? Epilepsy is often looked at as a, as a balance of two forces. Um, if you've got too much excitation, your brain can have unwanted electrical events known as seizures. If you have too little inhibition, 
the same thing can happen. So there's this balance between the accelerator, which is the excitatory neuron, and the, and the break or the inhibitory neuron. And if that balance gets disrupted by a disorder, you can tip into an inf unfavorable condition. You tip too far in one direction, you've got total sedation and you're comatose, you're asleep. You tip in the other direction, you, disorders like seizures and epilepsy can emerge. And it's very complex, and we know from Dan and from Nelson's lectures that you know, there are hundreds of neuron types, there are you know, millions and millions of synapses, and these things are connected in very complex ways. And this is just a tiny little connection you can see here. All these little micro machines, that orange thing is one of those excitatory neurons, and all those little things attached to it are other inhibitory neurons, the brakes. If you can think of the brain, I always use the analogy sometimes at a lecture as a jet fighter. A jet fighter, by design, is unstable. And they make it unstable so that it can do things quickly. If it's an inherently stable aeroplane design, like a jumbo jet, turns very slowly, a jet fighter can move quickly. Brains are quite nimble. They always want to go fast, they want to do things. And there's this intricate inhibitory system. All these other neurons watching what those other ones are doing, turning the brakes on here, stopping that from happening. A lot of control. And you can see if you break anything in there with a genetic mutation or a brain injury or an environmental challenge. If you break any of those, you can see how the system can stop working. And it's difficult to understand how do we undo that? How do we reverse that process? Um, if you drill down deeper, um, th this, is, this is an actual um, nerve on the bottom right. You can see there's a little cartoon of a nerve. It's got all different bits. Um, if you look down deeper, the little first bit that's called the axon initial segment, just uh, my, my pointer doesn't go over there, does it? This bit here, you blow it up. It's another little, little, little motor there with a whole, whole bunch of proteins in there that determine how this neuron behaves. And this is it here. There's this, we can look at that with one marker that lets us image that entire initial segment, and then you look in there and there are different genes. You recognise these genes, SCN1A and SCN2A. They, they live um, in, in, this, in these neurons. This is in, a, in one of those inhibitory or break neurons, and you've got SCN1A. This is one of those excitatory neurons, and you've got SCN2A. And you can see, well, you break this in Drave by diminishing 1.1. Generally, you get mutations that cause nonsense um, changes, and you don't have enough 1.1. 1 1.1, 1. 1, um, SCN1A is the gene, NAV 1.1 is the protein. So this is the blueprint, and this is the house. You don't have enough of this. In 1.2, in a lot of the um, disorders we look at, you have too much activity. So you have too much excitation, or not enough inhibition, you get epilepsy. It comes out slightly differently in these kids. They have different clinical presentations, but fundamentally you're disrupting this balance through those mechanisms. Um, and if you look at what happens, and you break the channel with the mutation, so this is in a neuron, you've got basically potassium channels, you've got restorative mechanisms which are called the sodium pumps, and when the neurons operate, they deplete the energy reserves, and they're restored by the sodium pump. Interestingly, there are mutations in these sodium pump, um, and it gives rise to another epileptic disorder called alternating hemiplegia of childhood, or AHC. And you see mutations in potassium channels, sodium pumps, sodium channels, all can cause neurogenetic disorders and seizures. And this is just some of the mutations in the NAV 1.1 that causes Drave. And when you look at what happens to the neuron when you've broken it, well, a normal neuron does this. And each of these little signals is pretty much the neuron telling the excitatory. And this, remember, this is inhibitory. This is the brake. You can think of each of these pulses of you stepping on the brake. Stop, stop, stop. And that's what that is. That, each time you do that, a little puff of a chemical comes out of the neuron and tells the excitatory neurons that, whoa, calm down. It's like, it's like a glass of red wine for me at night, each of those. <laughs> now, in the disease state, what you can see is the neuron here, it's not working well. When you're really, at this point, so this is when it's sort of, you know, stop, 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 just very calm. But now you're approaching a red light and you've really got to slam the brakes on hard. It's going, stop, stop, stop. These neurons, go, they start to fail. 
I can't maintain the state. This is a normal neuron. This is a neuron from an animal model that had one of these mutations in it. It runs out of puff when you most rely on it. So that's because there's not enough of this channel. In Drave, we've lost a copy. Normally, you, make, you have two copies, one from each parent. One of them is mutated, um, and then you don't have enough. And this deficiency of these sodium channels leads to a neuron that doesn't have enough energy to survive, to work properly. And this is just a, a, a way of looking at it, the normal situation. Neurons are told by these channels. You know, tell the brain to slow down. The neuron goes, OK, slow, signals to the brain, and it slows down. In Drave syndrome, one of those is missing. And it's, going, you know, it's a much smaller signal now. You know, and the neurons go, hang on, I can barely hear you. And it's saying slow, I think, but the brain's now not, not getting that signaling, and it's going faster and faster. And, it, and you can see why, and, and Anne mentioned this and Ingrid, generally speaking, drugs that actually block these channels further are not typically prescribed in Drave because they can make matters worse. Because you know, when you're actually starting to do things that it's already a deficit, you don't want to compound that. Oops, wrong computer. <laughs> you know, earlier, and we've seen this story, I've presented it, uh, my colleague Glenn King has presented it. You know, well, one, one, one approach to this is to make a drug that makes, you know how we've got two copies, one's missing, one's still there. Well, can we support it? Can we make a drug that makes that one copy work that little bit harder to bridge the deficit? And we successfully did that with this. This is a, a, a toxin that came out of a, a venom from a spider. And, and that toxin, spiders make all these toxins because they want to immobilize and kill other critters. So they make a whole bunch of stuff that's very, very biologically active. Now, this has been happening over you know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And we, when you look at this drug and you put it on the sodium channel, well, there it is there. That's before the drug, that's after the drug. The sodium channel is working harder. When you put it on a neuron, this is that neuron I showed you before, the Drave neuron, it peters out. Same neuron, put the drug on, it can maintain the firing. So when you can support the channel, you can then support the neuron. And the animals, A, this is the animal that's untreated, it has more and more seizures and eventually they all die and we can't measure them. The other animal, when you treat it, the seizures go away and they don't die. So it's, doing, it's a precision medicine because we're supporting the activity of the channel and we hope that these sorts of things, whether or not this can be a drug, it's really hard to take a peptide um, and deliver it. They're really unstable, they get chewed up by the body's fluids, put them in the brain, it's gone in half an hour. Um, you need to continually infuse it. A lot of challenges there. Maybe we could make another drug that does the same things as the peptide. It's called a peptide mimetic that will replace the action. That would be cool. Um, and there's a bit of activity in Drave now, so we're very hopeful. I'm just showing you here. If you look at that, all these companies are trying to do something in Drave, whether it's Zogenic, GW Pharma, um, Stoke Therapeutics, Opco, Novartis. We all know that they got programs in Drave and other companies, and we're hoping something will happen. Um, but then, then we get a story um, from Lynette Sadler and Ingrid Sheffer showing that, well, hang on, there's a, a new SCN1A phenotype emerge. There are some patients uh, that, that have got SCN1A mutations, but they look different clinically. And this was the paper. Not all SCN1A epileptic encephalopathies are Drave syndrome. And, and that was very puzzling um, when we heard about this and we read the paper, and, and, and there was this mutation. 3-N-226-methionine that was seen in multiple unrelated patients. And that sort of tells you two things. It tells you that the, this mutation, um, if you're going to have this syndrome, it's probably, A, it's not going to be as common as, as, as Drave syndrome. And, and the fact that it's arising in different patients tells us that because it's a very specific way of breaking the channel that leads to this very specific and more severe syndrome. And we need to, it's a, it's a great example of how important it is. And you could sort of write this up and say, oh yeah, it's a little, you know, it's just a, a variation on a theme. Obviously Ingrid and, and Lynette didn't write that off. And, and then we asked the question and, and we couldn't worry about what implications might this have for therapy? Would the drugs that would help Drave syndrome help a patient like this? And how many other examples are there in other genes that cause epilepsy, that we need to consider. And can we learn a lesson about that from this? So, 
understanding what happens. So how can it be? Because when you have dry base syndrome, the channel's gone. What can you do that's worse than removal of the channel? You think, well, it's gone. How can you make that a stronger effect than that not being there? Well, in, in the genetics world, there's this thing called dominant negative interaction. It's basically the concept that one bad apple spoils the bunch, spoils the barrel. And, and what happens is if you've got often proteins touch and they interact each other. And in channels and in ion channels and other genes, it's not just this one protein by itself. It forms a complex. If you have a mutant one, it can interact in a way and it can take down the healthy copy. But that doesn't happen for sodium channels. There's very, very little evidence. They're lonesome players. The alpha subunit, which is the 1.1, is by itself. So it's not really thought to interact physically. There's no touching where that mechanism might occur. It might happen and we haven't seen it, but you know, most of the literature says that this doesn't happen. So is there another way that this might occur that would explain, because that, that's the only mechanism we have left. The only way it can be worse than removal if it's doing something negative to the normal copy. So it's got to be impacting the normal copy in order to having that effect. So this is what we do. I'm not going to go into the details of it. We, we can, you know, investigate the, the very precise um, biophysical properties and the electrical properties of these channels. How do they work as little motors? What are they? These are the different methods we can apply. But if you look at it, what we saw, and, and we have this way of producing a mixture between a computer and a cell. It's a chimeric neuron. It's half real cell, half computer, and it lets us look directly, because normally you have to look at this and interpret these results, but when you combine these things in real time, it lets you look at, directly ask the question, how would this affect the properties of a nerve? Remember I showed you before about those Drava neurons that, that, that peter out? You look here, this is a, um, a, a, a normal neuron, and when we incorporate the, the channel that's got this, this mutation in, in the red, you can see, look how here, you can see here, the normal neuron's working, this channel peters out. And it peters out um, as you increase the stimulation, it peters out way earlier. You can, here it is here. The normal, this Newton channel, um, not only does it, it's more sensitive to um, stimulation than the wild type channel. So that means with very little stimulation, these, these neurons are over inhibiting. It's like, you, you, you shouldn't be breaking, but you are breaking. And then, when you get the actual real signal to break, it fails you. So you're almost flipping from masses amount of breaking to nothing at the wrong time. So these patients, and if the normal levels of signaling are in this domain, you can see how this mutant channel um, can't support that amount of firing. And so what we've discovered is that the way that this, and you can see it in this other experiment here, um, even more clearly. This is the properties of the mutant channel. This is the properties here in black of, of the wild type channel. And, and when, when a channel does this, it, it, it's no longer able, so this is actually affecting the healthy copy, not because of a direct physical interaction, but because the mutant channel produces an electrical environment that negatively impacts the healthy copy. So it's, even though it's not touching, it's an indirect um, mechanism to, to poison the healthy copy. So it's as though rather than touching someone, you're shouting at them from across the way and you're impacting their ability to function. So this actually, and what it tells us is that, well, this sort of patient that's got this sort of mutation has too much activity, not, not enough, in the channel itself. So the therapy I mentioned to you before that would increase the activity of the channels would only make matters worse in these patients. Paradoxically, sodium channel blockers that are not recommended for most Dravet patients may be effective. I don't know for sure, and it depends on the sodium channel, but they may be effective, and sort of theoretically, it's the sort of thing you might want to think about for patients like this. So we've, we've learned from, from this Dravet case how, how important it is to understand the mechanism and what 
very real. I mean, if we did develop a drug and these patients were ascertained genetically and someone said, oh yeah, they're Bravo, they have a mutation in SCN1A, without looking at the details of the clinical presentation, because not everybody is going to do that to the level that um, Ingrid and her colleagues do, you could have some terrible outcomes. And it's really important for the field that we don't make those missteps, that we don't harm patients, and, and Anne mentioned that, don't we know we, we can't do any harm, and knowledge is the only way we can avoid that. And this is a really nice way of looking at it. Um, this was done actually by a, um, a, neurology, uh, was a neurologist who started a PhD with us and is fascinated by modelling. Um, he's produced, this is not just, don't worry about what the axes are, but just think of it as a map, all right? This is a map, and you can think of this as a nice, this is a cliff, with the ocean here, and this is like the land. Normal neurons, and you want to be on the land. You, can't, you don't want to be in the ocean, you're going to struggle. The normal neurons live on a nice plateau on this land, and this is where their, where their state behaviour is. So the wild type neurons are here, well away from the cliff, and you do things to them with different perturbations and drugs, and they're still in the safe zone. They're in this plateau. But the neuron with the mutation is right on the edge of this cliff. And you've only got to do the smallest thing and it plummets into this behaviour that's very counterproductive. So we use these mathematical methods and these ways of trying to understand the source of the instability. And it's a really powerful way. And then you might even say, well, who cares? It's this. But you might think, well, you know what? We can look at drugs that manipulate the behaviour of the neuron and of the channels and they may move it across in this space. And we can use things like saying, well, do we want to get drugs that move you away from this type of behaviour into this type of behaviour? So it's a really powerful way of how you can take research, how you can take biophysical, mathematical understanding and apply it to real world problems. And that's sort of what the passion of MindGrab is. As I said, we're not clinicians, but we do want to take all these disparate um, sources of data and think of novel and interesting ways you know, work with our, our, our um, commercial partners like, like Nelson and his colleagues and put these ideas in front of them. Is it a new way of thinking about developing um, a, a therapy that's going to help people? I think I don't have to do this now because I explained it so well. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> it's, um, and, and I mentioned most of these things. I think it's important to say that, 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 that you know, these are important take-home messages. Precision medicine we developed for driving now, unlikely beneficial for these, these patients. Maybe the zoogenic drug that doesn't directly target the sodium channel is a different thing, and that, that could be good. But the things that Stoke Therapeutics are doing, Opco are doing, uh, Novartis are doing, that seem to be directly increasing the activity of sodium channels, you'd, have, you'd be very cautious. Um, and, in, and in these cases, unlike normal drive, sodium drugs could be beneficial. And it really highlights this, the take-home message, the need for precision diagnostics that bridge the clinical, genetic and functional assessments to help ensure the best medicines reach the right patients. And I'll just acknowledge the people that worked on this, who are the authors on this paper. Thank you very much. We've got one right over there. I just quickly, um, my son has KCNA2, so he has a potassium channel problem. His variant, though, is gain and loss of function. Do you know if there's any work being done in gain and loss at all across any of these? Uh, in, in, in a lot of cases. I mean, some variants have that, have that problem that, that they fail in one department and do something in another department, and, and then the approach to that could be very different to when it's pure gain or pure loss. And that's why some of the therapeutic approaches we're looking at around antisense oligotherapies that can reduce a specific allele are the ways to think about disorders like that. And I know people for um, KCNQ2, there's similar thoughts of making what they call an allele-specific um, molecule. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the specificity has to arise as a result of the exact mutation that your, your child might have, but there are, there are common variations in the population that you could use that tag along with your mutation, and therefore there are ways that we're thinking can we target a, a bigger group of patients. So there are, there are thoughts around that, and it's definitely on our radar. Fantastic, thanks. Other questions? Yes. 
We'll get your mic. Sorry, can I just... Oh, no, you can read it, it, it It's Star Lawrence. I'm a paediatrician from Adelaide. Um, I just want to say, I don't actually have a question, but I look after a number of children with dry weight. I just want to say a huge thank you to you because that was the best ex explanation of sodium channel blockers and not that I've actually heard. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, our son doesn't have... Um, any distinct mutation that can be identified as yet, but he probably does have genetic epilepsy. Um, and basically every medication's been tried on him. And Felbamate works. And um, does a particular drug working indi indicate that it could be a specific type of epilepsy? I, I mean, that's probably a better question to be answered by clinicians, but I, I, th I think it's a very difficult thing. A, a lot of these drugs we don't even know, they, they tend to do lots of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I think it's really difficult to, to turn that backwards. I mean, I don't know with Thalbamate whether there's any specific things, but generally speaking. Yes, go ahead. Actually. A good panel question, yeah. Okay, we'll, add, yeah, we'll ask that later on the panel. Yeah, hi. Um, so I guess when we started this journey, I've got a little girl who's nearly five with Dravet. Um, and when we first started the journey, it took us a long time to get the results that it was an SCN1A um, genetic sort of thing. So when you're talking about the phenotypes coming into it now, do you think that in the future or near future, when we get the testing, the genetic testing done, is it going to start going down to a phenotype level or...? I, I think the clinical phenotype is really important and I think good clinicians will be able to probably separate Drave from that other syndrome that, that Ingrid pointed out and, uh, and maybe that any patients that are in the grey area you might need to go to that next level and we're thinking of ways of making these sort of functional assessments more accessible to clinicians because there's not something that a clinician can easily call up and get done. I mean, you know, Ingrid works with us, she might say, listen, can you look in this particular case and we can do it, but that's not always the case and um, that's only in, in a few sort of tertiary centres around the world w where that might happen. And it may be the case, I mean, for other mutations, I mean, we also work on SCN2A, there the split's almost even. Half of the kids have a loss of function, the other half have a gain of function. And we want to know whether the clinical differences, which there are, are sufficient to qualify them for therapy type A or therapy type B. And eventually, with clinical experience of new drugs, you'll get that. Early on, we probably need to be cautious for, so we don't do any harm. All right, I'm going to allow us one more question, but then we're going to have to take a break because we are really in danger of time. Yes, and I know you're starving. Any more? Good. Yay, thank you.